All right, well, let us plow ahead if we can. I think um, we will have discussions, to, uh, I think two discussions in this uh, part because I have two parts. Um, I've got, I call this communion with the real, and uh, between Mark, uh, Tony and I, we came up with this idea of the heart at its happiness, happiest. I, I want to talk to you about inviting the real, and I want to talk to you about the real inviting, too. And uh, so I think that um, given the work that you have done so far in subsidiary focal integration and our uh, being poised to start to move into this idea of loving in order to know, um, I've already made the point that um, best epistemic practices should be those who, that those which invite the real. So what I'd like to give you is a selection from my catalog, my epistemological etiquette, and um, even in the book, this is never meant to be complete. I think what you do in life is come up with ways to invite the real. And so uh, this catalog can be added to by you. <laughs> and you can, you can take uh, pieces of it that you like and, and develop it as well. So um, this film is The Black Stallion. I don't know if you ever knew Walter Farley's books for little girls who wanted to grow up to, to be horses <laughs> like me. But uh, in any case, I loved The Black Stallion. And then when this movie came out, it was am amazing. But, uh, there's a shipwreck and, and this incredibly beautiful horse is shipwrecked as well as this, this boy and of course the horse had been mistreated and, and all of that. So these two survive and wash up on an island and then what we've got is this incredible cinematography of this dance of inviting the real between these two these two creatures and in the end he is riding the horse. <laughs> so that's a lovely moment. And so what I want to give you is I, I've actually got five loci, I call them, of, uh, of uh, etiquette uh, th things to do to invite the real. The first one being love and you'll see those in the bottom right hand corner. But love invites the real and you've already started to give some examples of that and so you can think of love either as an action or as a reception so active receptivity or receptive activity uh, i think you can probably think of lots of movies of of romance <laughs> that are playing out that dynamic um, but both of those uh, are the sort of thing that would invite reality to come and uh, ra you can think of rapture uh, notice, wonder, and delight are all these things that invite the real. Here's some really wonderful comments that uh, pertain to this. Um, I get this from R.T. Allen, who is an English uh, philosopher and a Polanian, and um, he writes that uh, da Vinci said that every love is the daughter of a great cognition, and R.T. Allen says, oh no, if it's Christian epistemology, every cogn cognition is the daughter of a love. So, so the love comes first, and then the knowing comes after that, and that, he would say, is Christian epistemology. David Bentley Hart, I think you might get to know in a personal way next year, I hear, but uh, he writes that delight is the premise of any sound Christian epistemology. And if you think of uh, getting to know a person, for example, there's simply no, we no way that a, um, a critical stance would invite that person to self-disclose. But delight is essential, right? So delight is the premise of a sound Christian epistemology. And then from Annie Dillard and Pilgrim of at Tinker Creek, she writes that it is the lovers who see. So all of those are, are examples or are ideas that have to do with how love invites the real. Um, I talk about readiness to know in Little Manual for Knowing, and uh, this uh, is leading on to what I'm gonna say in the next part also, and that is, um, there, there's certain things that grow us as knowers, and actually it's love that grows us to be uh, somebody who can give in love to invite the real. So, so I'm going to say it all begins with the uh, mother's smile, the loving gaze of the other, and in particular, somehow what needs to happen is that you need to see yourself being seen with delight. 
And um, you, I'm sure you don't remember your mother's rapturous gaze. <laughs> um, but all you need to do is look at another mother with a baby or another father with a baby. I, I think maybe the most gorgeous thing in the world is a young father holding his one-year-old daughter on his arm and glowing. So this works really two ways. But um, I really feel that the parent's job, first job, is to delight, to delight in their children. And then as life goes on, you've got other people that delight in you. And those are the faces that you need to see. And you actually need to see them seeing you and seeing you with regard and, and delight. And what that does is grow you into someone who can be a lover too. And obviously, if we love in order to know, that's going to make you better at knowing. Toni Morrison is a famous American author. And uh, she was once asked, to what course of study do you owe your literary prowess? And she said, oh, no course of study. I owe it to the fact that as a child, whenever I came into a room where my father was, his eyes lit up. That's beautiful, isn't it? So you see, this has to do with inviting reality to come as part of our loving to know. Uh, to invite the reality to come, there's, there's these things that involve composure. All right, so, so one is just simple openness. So if you would want to invite reality to come, you've got to be open to it coming. <laughs> okay, you've got to welcome its coming. So I love this line from Abraham Joshua Heschel, that the Greeks, whoever they are, you know, I'm not, it's not about the Greeks and the Hebrews, it's about learning in order to comprehend as opposed to learning in order to be apprehended. So. You, the, to whatever it is that you want to love to know, you have to be having a posture of openness to invite it to come. Here's another one, presence. Uh, a kind of composure to be at home. Uh, if you're checked out and distant, obviously you're not going to invite reality to come. So the idea of radical attentiveness to uh, that which you are kinding, uh, wanting to know. Do you know the horse? I don't know whether people on this side of the world would know. Famous American horse in 1938. His name is Seabiscuit. And uh, the clue is that those are California mountains behind him. <laughs> I don't know if you read the book or, or saw the film, but obviously his trainer was an amazing um, horse whisperer and person whisperer, too. I think he invited the jockey just as he invited the reality of the horse, and Seabiscuit gave his all. So uh, I call my work Covenant Epistemology uh, to underscore the fact that pledge is involved in love. So if you love in order to know, you have to pl pledge in order to love. And pledge is kind of like, and covenant are kind of like the things that you um, uh, uh, um, give yourself to or comply with um, the boundaries that you follow, um, the, just those things that you need to do out of faithfulness uh, in order to love. So I say in longing to know that knowing is like a wedding. You pledge to love, honor, and obey, and then you will be graced, maybe, <laughs> with a gracious self-disclosure of the real. But the promise, the pledge comes first. And it's that which brings safety to the real that you're welcoming so that they can self-disclose. I love the idea of consent. Uh, it takes a saying yes to something uh, for there to be knowing. And so consent, self-binding, risk, trust, sacrifice are all things that we pretty regularly uh, think are involved in coming to know something. Just think of the the amount of time that we might spend practicing the piano if we want to learn to play it, or the amount of time we give ourselves to lessons of any sort, including academics and, and uh, just all kinds of study. Just to read a book is to um, give yourself in pledge to the thing that you're holding and um, uh, being willing to listen to what it says. So there's a lot of... Uh, 
different pieces of that pledge. One is that you pledge to give yourself to what you do not yet know. You think about that. If, if knowing is about uh, uh, coming to know, having a relationship with the yet to be known, all right, so you're pledging yourself to give yourself to what you do not yet know. And that's obviously scary and risky. And you have to decide whether you're going to count the cost. You pledge to do what it takes to live life on the terms of the yet to be known. You've got to say, OK, I'm going to do this. When I was teaching uh, in my classes, that we always have, a, have to produce a syllabus that's going to say, uh, you know, what will be required of the student, what reading, what projects, uh, what exams. And uh, I would say, okay, I'm going to read you your rights, which is what you say when you, you know, you've brought somebody in to arrest them. Uh, but then what I say is, I think covenantally about this. And so these are my obligations to you. And these are what I'm saying will be your obligations if you're going to be invited into the real. And so I, I said, I would say to my students, um, you know, we, we're not going to have a ceremony here, but somewhere along the line, you've got to say, okay, I'm going to trust her. I'm going to do what she says. And I'm going to do it even if I don't understand. And I'll commit myself to do it to go through the course. And so, though there isn't a ceremony, there's something ceremonial about that, um, pledging to do the work that it will take. I think it's also pledging to give welcoming space for the gracious disclosure of the other. It's somehow, you've got to be hospitably open in order for reality to come. And um, it's, got to be, uh, uh, it's got to be welcoming. Um, if you are forcing the knowing, <laughs> right, uh, then the thing that you're wanting to know is not able to be themselves as they respond to you. Okay? We need to pledge to be open to how it will change us. That's a muskrat up there. I learned, because I learned this from Annie Dillard, Pilgrim at Tinker Creek. She talked about stalking muskrats. Um, and this is where I got the idea of, of the covenantal in knowing. As she, she said in there, you've got to learn what she called the via negativa. You've got to learn to do the knowing on the terms of the muskrat, which means you've got to swallow your pride, swallow your dignity. You've got to sit very still for a very long time. And then you just might be graced with seeing a muskrat. So what I was hearing in this, you know, don't, don't scratch your nose, you know, don't do this, don't do that, was this covenantal self-binding to live life on the terms of the yet to be known. I would think you can come up with lots of examples of this as we uh, talk. Here's another one I just love. That's Zacchaeus in the, in the, uh, the print, the, uh, you know, the whatever that is, pen and ink. Um, drawing there. Of course, Zacchaeus was a wee little man, <laughs> and he climbed up in the sycamore trees because he wanted to see the Lord. Well, we always have to, in our knowing, and I'm starting to talk strategy here, we've, we've got to place ourselves where reality is going to show up. So I was very excited to come to Australia because I wanted to see the stars. And I wanted to see the Southern Cross. So, so um, I came a long way to put myself in the way of knowing <laughs> with regard to the Southern, the, the southern sky. Um, this is pretty obvious, but as we've said that all knowing involves an authoritative guide, really what we've got to do in life is choose wise guides. So um, the F-15 uh, jet is in there because I had a student in a second career. He was in a, a seminary class, and I made this point about choosing wise guides and about authoritative guides. This was his second career. He had been a fighter pilot, and he said, tell them, tell them, there's no way to fly an F-15 without an authoritative guide. So there, I've done it. <laughs> <laughs> but every time students sign up for courses, register for courses, they're choosing authoritative guides. We're doing this through every area of life we, we, are, we navigate by 
uh, making choices with regard to authoritative guides. I have a, a former student who is uh, quite the go-getter scholar. His name is Drew Johnson, and uh, he teaches at the King's College in New York City and has written several books, beginning with showing how in scripture, in all the genres of scripture, the first thing that has to happen in knowing is choosing the right guide, starting with Adam and Eve and then he goes through every genre. And then the second thing is, you have to do what the guide says. And then the third thing is, then you might come to understand. So, choose wise guides. Live life on the terms of the yet to be known. I'm sure I've said this already. I certainly was trying to live life on bandits' terms as to, f to figure out what this little bird needed. I love this one, noticing regard. That's Jesus and the woman at the well, because when I figured this all out, it just automatically connected in my mind with John 4. Because it wasn't because Jesus named that woman sins that she went delightedly racing to collar her enemies to drag them back to meet Jesus. No, it was that he saw her. He saw her. And in that seeing, he conferred dignity on that person. So we need the gaze of the delighted other. We need the gaze of someone who is gazing at us with regard. And uh, I hope you can think of lots of examples of this. One that comes to mind just now is my, my former and uh, you know forever friend in philosophy, but former colleague Bob Frazier, who who I was so blessed to work with at Geneva College, and I have to say he saw me, and he saw me with noticing regard. I would also say that about John Stanley, my friend in the back. He's got his own slide up here, but, but when I uh, met John in the town that I used to live in, in, uh, in the Pittsburgh area, and John had a ministry, John sees people, and he saw me, and then when I brought my students down to the cafe, he saw them as well. Simone Weil in uh, Waiting for God has this incredibly moving account of the Good Samaritan and how there is this unseen lump of flesh in the gutter, but it is the Good Samaritan who sees, and she says, love sees what is invisible, and she calls that creative attention. So here's John. John, wave at everybody. You're standing, sitting there at the back. This is what John looks like now. That's what he looked like a long time ago <laughs> when he was a captain of the church army. Are you still a captain of the church army? I still have an Oh, you do? <laughs> OK. Well, anyway, um, so he came to my broken town of, of Aliquippa, very post-industrial and uh, kind of a ghetto of a town. And when I first saw it, first I didn't go there because when I moved to that area, people said, don't go to Aliquippa, you'll get shot. Um, but when I got my courage to go down there, my heart started to long for this cute little uh, ghost town. And uh, then a, a year or two later, I met John and heard about this cafe. And my heart just recognized everything that I was longing for to happen in Aliquippa. So I had to go down and check out John to make sure he was on the up and the up. And uh, this Uncommon Grounds Cafe was a listening space, and John was committed to listening evangelism, as he uh, calls it. And uh, volunteers were taught to listen and to listen and to listen. <laughs> so um, Eugene Gendlin, a, a psychiatrist I once heard, uh, says that people don't even have a story until you listen to them. So part of inviting the real is listening. Listening is not a passive recording of information. Listening face to face is that which confers dignity, noticing regard, and invites the real to come. So listening invites the real. In Aliquippa, uh, lots of people, because this was a broken city, lots of people had a false story when they started talking. So I had in my mind that those, those old water pumps, where you pump them and the water comes out dirty at the beginning. But the more you pump, you have to pump until the water runs clean. And so you have to listen until people st 
start to tell their story truly, which involved saying, help, I need help, <laughs> right? So what I'm in is not right, and I need someone beyond me to help. And at that point, John would say, people save themselves. He said it, not me, I'm just quoting you, go see him. By the way, John now is uh, the minister at St. George's Anglican in Paddington. So it's a really great reunion <laughs> that uh, he and Allison and Stacy and I have been having. The word indwelling comes from Michael Polanyi, but this is about Barbara McClintock, a famous geneticist who, who has a, a Nobel Prize for working with corn. And uh, the biography of her life is called A Feeling for the Organism. And um, she speaks of the need for respect for difference a, and also a kind of sympathy that allows intimacy without doing away with otherness. And one of the things that's going on here, and I, I don't know quite how to fit this in, but the yet to be known is the other. And I, when I say other, I'm not using the word dismissively. I'm using the word as that which, to which we owe regard, uh, to, on which we confer dignity. And so if you're, you know, inviting the real, you are inviting something to come to you that's other than you, <laughs> right? But will feel at home in a hospitable, in a hospitable place. Did you ever hear of Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance? This came out when I was 21, and uh, I finally read it about a decade ago. And uh, uh, do, did you, did you, do you remember this? If you, if you read the book, How You Fix a Motorcycle, it's peace of mind. <laughs> so again, you've got to quiet yourself to listen to the motorcycle, right? So, and you do that to invite the real. So. Polani is the one who comes up with this idea of indwelling the clues subsidiarily, but that certainly means sitting with what, what is coming to you and getting inside of it in an empathetic sort of a way. Do you know this word, perichoresis? So uh, Cappadocian fathers got this idea that this lively dance was really a great picture of how the, the members of the Trinity re, uh, re, respond to each other. And so there's, there's lovely interpenetration. I think of it as overture response. It's dancing around, so may I have this dance? Yes, you may. May I have this dance? Yes, you may. Overture response, back and forth, back and forth. And I would like to suggest that that overture response is really the dynamic of the real. And, uh, and it's also the dynamic of flourishing. So as your organization, your football team, your classroom, uh, your, your worship experience starts to kind of lift <laughs> and levitate off the ground in this lovely overture and response, so I give to you and you give back to me, that's the dynamic of perichoresis. And that itself invites the reality to come, okay? That means that in our knowing, and I think this is the way it was supposed to be at the beginning when you think of, of uh, the cultural mandate in Genesis 1, um, it's supposed to be this way that knowing brings healing. That's, that's what's supposed to happen. Knowing is an encounter that leaves the real and you in a different place and in communion, okay? So again, it's not passive registering of information, and if it is passive uh, registering of information, that actually is unhealing, okay? I've got a... I, I may not have that quote in here, but this from Robert Farrer Capon, that boredom is the fertilizing principle of unloveliness. Okay, so you cannot comport yourself in a manner of indifference and have that be healing or even indifferent. It's actually damaging with regard to what you want to know. 
like to say that taking the use, Eucharist is itself <laughs> the best epistemic practice. It certainly is the paradigm uh, for loving in order to know, and it's pretty remarkable. I'll never forget about the time I met John. I went to my first celebration of the Eucharist, and my eyes were opened because it became apparent to me that the real reason you go to church is to invite Jesus, and he comes. And why else would you go to church? That's the main act. So 2006 was a good year. Communion invites the real. So if you've got a uh, relationship of involvement with a garden and you love in order to know and you're inviting the real, um, you get so you've got a flourishing garden, right? And then the flourishing garden gives more and more. So the communion, the perichoresis itself feeds what is the beginning of an ongoing uh, lively relationship of love. I, uh, two years ago, I moved downstream on the Ohio River to a little old house in an old city, another old city, and um, the woman before me loved comfrey. Do you all know what comfrey is? Well, it's this, this uh, what is it? Is it a herb? I don't know, but I mean, it's the best thing for your garden. So gardeners make comfrey tea. You can just cut, cut the comfrey off and put it in your compost pile. Well, she was doing that before I moved in, and I want to tell you, all my plants look like they're on steroids. So you might want to check that comfrey out. Okay, time for our conversations. After this, I'm going to have a little bit on the real inviting you, and then uh, we'll have another conversation. So this is the first of the two conversations in this talk. So what I would love to know is your reflection about inviting the real. What real are you inviting? Uh, what are some of the maxims of epistemological etiquette that you already are practicing, some of this list that I've given you? And which one or ones might you seek to add? Perhaps you have another example or, or a candidate for um, uh, epistemological etiquette or good behavior to invite the reality invite the real. And also then, if you can think of an example of some knowing that has led to shalom, that's really beautiful too. So let's take, oh, let's say five to seven minutes and um, grab yourself a cup of coffee while you're talking, because it's not going to be more than seven minutes, and then we'll talk to each other. All right.